the new con the boom, or the way uh, Eric Adams would call it, uh, condos baby condos. <laughs> so we are joined by uh, some of uh, Brooklyn's most active condo developers, but mostly condo developers. What's kind of interesting about our market is there's about uh, 36,000 residential uh, units under the development pipeline, in different stages of the development pipelines, pipeline in Brooklyn right now. But only just under 1,700 uh, were sort of declared or announced as condos, which is less than 5%. Uh, so we kind of, when we're looking at this pipeline at Terra CRG, we're thinking that probably there's that, that percentage is going to probably double by the time all these units are going to be uh, completed and online. But it's still a, a, a very small fraction of everything that's coming online. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today about uh, what these guys are up to and uh, how this market kind of evolved in the last few years. Um, but what I really wanted to start, and I know it's kind of like the biggest elephant in the room right now, uh, you know, last night at midnight, I was uh, sitting by my phone waiting for a call from Albany that um, they extended the uh, 421A in a, a little bit. Uh, I know that uh, Boaz and I and uh, Martin's partner were, went to Albany last Monday in uh, had conversations with some senators, and as a result, uh, they were trying to add condo units back into the, the proposal. But uh, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm just kind of wondering. A lot of these, a lot of the guys on stage here are developing condos uh, without 421A uh, benefits. Some of them have some. Some of the projects have 421A. I just want to kind of go th through it and flush it out a little bit and see how people feel about the limbo that we're essentially we're in right now. I mean, we're it's. Uh, June 16, and there's no 421A. So, uh, anyone wants to jump in? I guess I will. Um, uh, we have uh, a little bit over 100 units right now in the market, and um, we'll come into market in the next uh, month altogether. And what I see right now is not a big impact. I mean, but we have to remember that the interest rates are very, very low. So, as interest go up, and it will go up, uh, we all know that. Uh, we don't know when, but it will. I think the the clientele we serve, which is a middle class Brooklyn, we don't do uh, luxury, you know, Williamsburg, Dumbo, etc. I think it's going to start to impact. So so far, from what I, the feedback we're getting from apartments and lofts, who are the brokers on the condos, is that the product is moving. I see offers at asking price above asking price. Uh, but I think it's going to change as uh, interest rates going to change. And you, Boaz, Boaz, for those of you uh, that don't know, Boaz is developing uh, in neighborhoods that are sort of up and coming. So the pricing points yeah, are... If you want to look at our per square foot, I'm not sure anymore what's up and coming is. But uh, yeah, we specialize in Bushwick, Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, etc. And, and David, you, you, you're currently in the final stages of marketing of the, one of the priciest per square foot condos in Brooklyn. Uh, no tax abatement, ground lease, very high sort of monthly carrying cost, and you still have record-breaking uh, record prices. Uh, what was the effect, that the, the conversations that you guys had with, with, with buyers? Are you talking about the tax abatement yes. specifically? Well, so we, uh, we had no opportunity to do 421A there because the pilot uh, goes to the park, and um, so it was a foregone conclusion that we were just going to have to go forward without it. We've done different things in different neighborhoods where we've thought people might be more sensitive to taxes than others, and so we've done some on-site affordable to convey a very significant tax abatement. And we're finding that people are not as sensitive to taxes as we had anticipated. Um, we have some of the stuff that where we're doing on site, you're talking about a 20-year abatement, and this is in Manhattan, though, a 20-year abatement um, where it's a full abatement for 12 years, which is really kind of unusual. And I don't think buyers um, are valuing it as much as we thought that they would. So in Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, like I said, we didn't have a choice. And we came out um, initially somewhat conservative. You mentioned there was a ground lease. There was no tax abatement. And I think we came out around 1,400 a foot knowing that we had a really unique product, great views, great amenities, some hotel amenities, um, on-site parking. And um, we quickly uh, raised prices. We're probably averaging, I don't know, some, somewhere around uh, 1,800 a foot right now. Um, and um, 
we have a couple of buyers who come in who are used to always buying a new construction in Brooklyn and having the tax abatement, and they just walk out the door. There's like, no way we will pay this. But the majority of people come in and they say, you know, it's just an, ad an extra month, you know, cost on my monthly nut, and uh, we like the product, and so we'll go forward with it. But do you think it's as a result of the fact that uh, your sort of niche or your, pro your pricing points are very, very high, so people that can afford two and a half to five million dollar apartments, for them, you know, carrying cost of an NR, I don't know, six, seven thousand dollars a month may not be as meaningful. I mean, is that? Yeah, they're less sensitive. And so, you know, we, we do projects in Manhattan where we don't even consider going for the tax abatement. We don't think it's meaningful, but other neighborhoods we have done it. And here, as it relates to Brooklyn, they're probably the least sensitive Brooklyn buyers because they are paying the high price point. But there are some people who just don't like paying taxes, you know, and it's really hard to, uh, <laughs> you know, and they and they're very the income is very you know it's a lot of uh, big cash income so I don't think they like paying real estate taxes or income taxes either but uh, the famous Brooklyn Republican <laughs> can you actually uh, you were one of the first developers that made that strategic decision to not go for a tax abatement I think you theoretically you could have gone for an eighty twenty when you did it. Um, well, we do have an ICAP tax abatement because we're building a hotel and retail below. So that, that helps a little bit. But, you know, we, we studied um, where historic sales had been and couldn't really find a discernible difference in per foot sales pricing um, on projects that historically had had 421A in prime Brooklyn neighborhoods and those that didn't. And given that... Um, we had a large commercial component to our project. 8020 wasn't really a feasible option for us. So we would have, we would have had to have gone out and bought the certificates. Um, and we just made the economic decision that it didn't make sense to do so. Um, my caveat to that is that that was also when we were underwriting about $900 a foot in Borham Hill. And things have changed uh, dramatically. So I think to Boaz's point, it's really about um, your monthly uh, outlay. People who are making $500,000 to a million dollars a year, which is really our sort of core buyer, that monthly outlay is very, very important to them. And if interest rates were moderately higher, I think that for us, we would see a bit of a slowdown um, given where our pricing is, and we probably would find some benefit from 421A. Uh, and in summation, I would just add that I think it's really a shame, particularly on the rental front, that, um, that things are as they are right now because to Jeff and, and Elliot's earlier points, it really is essential to building affordable housing and building rental in this yeah, if, if I mean, I can tell you that from my perspective as an as a investment sales broker, we, we can't sell <clears throat> nothing right now for rental development. And we, we actually couldn't sell anything for rental development in the last six months probably. Uh, because people didn't want to sort of butt against the deadline at this point. So unless there's a meaningful plan that would be announced soon, uh, most of the transactions that you'll see are going to be for sale housing in the prime neighborhoods. And, and I think, you know, one of the biggest um, uh, sufferers of this, of this limbo are going to be larger projects in sort of secondary neighborhoods like Best Tide, Bushwick, uh, and Crown Heights, which... Um, you know, if you're doing a 200, 300,000 square feet project in these neighborhoods, you're not going to do a 500 unit condo in these secondary markets because A, you don't know if their demand is there and B, no bank is going to finance it. Um, and so these projects are just not going to get built until there is um, meaningful um, uh, extension or a new, a new program that we which we hope is going to take place. I think you're selling a couple of sites right now for condo development that used to be right. rental sites, right? Right, because, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, you're setting the comp, flank, flank is setting the comps, and we're taking advantage. But, uh, Martin, do you want to talk a little bit about 51J? Because that's actually a project in Dumbo that has the abatement. How, how did that come about? So I, I, I think you made a very good point earlier about sort of hedging yourself against when the market turns a little bit. And I think we made a decision... Um, to buy certificates for that project with the understanding that we didn't really think it was going to add a tremendous amount of value on the price per foot sale prices that we're currently getting. But in, in light of a potential 
downturn interest rates moving up, the market moving a little bit in the wrong direction, to have that in place, I, we thought was a tremendous opportunity to hedge the downside protection that we have. Um, similar to you know what you were saying, I think we started off at you know in the mid 1300s a foot and quickly moved our numbers into around $1,600 a foot, and that's sort of where it seems like we're settling right now in our average units. Um, and you know the pentest units are going for for big numbers like like some of the other ones over two thousand dollars a foot, but if the market were to have moved where numbers moved into the twelve hundred or eleven hundred dollars a foot where monthly nut like we're all discussing becomes a very important part of of the decision making for a potential buyer, we thought that having the certificates in place gave us a competitive advantage over some of the other product coming to the market. Right. And then, yeah, I think you're one of the last people that actually bought a big chunk of. Uh, of certificates when they were still available a couple, I guess it was like 18 months ago or something? Yeah, I mean, like, I'll give you an example. We're working on another project on 4th Avenue and 1st Street that we initially had um, planned to do a rental project on, and we bought certificates for that particular property, and we're now converting it into condos, and we're not going to be using those certificates at that property. Um, and that's because we don't think it adds any value, and we think we're in the time of the cycle where we're going to be in the market in the next three to four months selling units, and you know, don't feel that interest rates or the market's going to move dramatically, that we need to sort of protect ourselves from the downside. Got it. Um, Jeff, you also marketing right now, uh, or I guess Dave Mondrell is marketing for you, uh, a project in, uh, on Bridge Street in Dumbo. That project has an abatement? It absolutely does. And I think, you know, one point to consider is um, simple supply and demand economics here. Um, both Martin's project and our project, both at 421A, they're projects that compete against each other. They're down the block from one another. If one had it and one did not, I think the one that has would certainly do much better in price per square foot. Um, I think the same thing happened in Manhattan if you went back in time to 2006, 2007. Every project had 421A. And those that did not really suffered on their price points, um, especially doorman full service buildings. It's just the absolute dollars that a consumer has to pay on a monthly basis um, was somewhat you know, dysfunctional compared to a property that had the 421As. Um, we bought certs for, for that project. We actually just closed on certs last week for a, a rental property that we're doing in Park Slope. Um, I don't think there are very many certs around. Sounds like there are some, according to Martin. But in general, there are, there are not a lot of certs available because of the uncertainty. Um, we, we've taken a, you know, a similar position to what you suggested, Ofer. We built rental and condo. Um, in the last six months, we've become a lot less active in buying property in Brooklyn, the uncertainty of 421A. It was very easy for, for brokers to say, well, a rental property, if you don't get the 421A, it's simply a condo. We haven't exactly, uh, we don't really drink the Kool-Aid on that concept right now. Um, you know, maybe in the next couple of months, we'll see when things settle and the price points kind of, um, you know, come down a little bit. Uh, but we're, we're doing, you know, we're at four or five, we have five 421A projects between Brooklyn um, and Manhattan that are, you know, rental or condo. And... Um, we think it's going to have a significant impact, um, most importantly on, you know, for the folks in this room, on land prices over the next six months. We'll see. <laughs> but, but let's talk a little bit about the uh, sort of like the demand side. So everybody's marketing. I mean, I just, I failed to mention. So the, the group uh, we have here is uh, in the process of doing, I think, 1,400, developing 1,400 units, which if you take our 1,600, 1,700 uh, uh, unit, pipeline seriously. I mean, the majority of the pipeline is being represented here. But how is the demand in open houses? And so I think that, you know, because there's, there's like maybe five or six years there was no condo development, uh, there's a pent-up demand for these uh, for sale housing opportunities in Brooklyn, and there's a demographic that really sort of grew in Brooklyn and really needs a place to live. Uh, but the question is, I guess that the question is I'm, 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 I'm getting to is how deep is that buyer pool, that demand, and, and what kind of excitement do you see in open house and how hungry you are to do more projects? Boss, you have 870 units under the pipeline uh, across 45 projects. So you must be bullish. <laughs> um, yes. Um, as long as, um, I, 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 think, I think the, um, the key is the affordability. Uh, Brooklyn is no longer just, uh, we all know that, it's, it's not news, that people choose to live in Brooklyn because it's Brooklyn, not because they can't afford Manhattan. Uh, and there's a huge movement of middle class. So strategically, except for, I would say, four projects of ours, which is more the luxury market, 
uh, in their boutique size. Um, most of our product is for first time buyers, 25 to 35 hipsters basically. And they have steady jobs and good income and good credit. And they want to live in Brooklyn. I don't, I don't think it's about money. I, I think if we gave them a, if someone gave them a product for the same price in Harlem or uh, more expensive in the Upper East Side, they will still choose to uh, live in Brooklyn because Brooklyn has a very unique experience of you still get a coffee and the person who makes coffee for you knows your name versus just walking to a Starbucks, which is what's happening because of the tr transition in retail in Manhattan. Um, and those people are demanding uh, housing and brownstones are insane numbers. But how quickly are you selling out a project? I mean, Jeff, you, you've been, you're 60% you sold your project? Yeah. yeah. That I mean, took you... Yeah, I mean, we, if, if, if I guess we've been at it for a couple of months, but we've been right. holding our prices and our, our building is you know, scheduled to be complete this fall. So we're really not, you know, rushing into deals that don't make sense. We're holding our prices and you know, the, the folks that are buyers are very much qualified. We really haven't right. had any questionable buyers, even those that didn't make an offer and versus those that do make offers. So we really are, are seeing some great people. But if you ask me where they're coming from, I, I would say in general, they're, they're folks that lived in Manhattan at some point. They generally work in Manhattan. Um, I don't think we've seen too many creative folks um, at our Dumbo property. When we were leasing in, in uh, pronounced Lofts in Williamsburg, at the end of last year, I would say it was 50-50 uh, folks that you know, were paying you know, 70, 80 dollars square foot rent. So, you know, half of them were, were local in Brooklyn and half of them were coming from Manhattan every day. I think it's just neighborhood by neighborhood. I think it's just a different right. flavor. Right, Ken, you, you're 75% sold on the Borum? 80, 80. as of today. Exactly. How long did it take you? We, we did probably about 10% um, prior to actually launching publicly. And, and most of it, most of this, these sales happen pre-construction, essentially. Yeah, and that's, um, that's been since Thanksgiving. So surprisingly, our biggest month to date was actually December of last year, um, rivaled by this past March. Um, but now the velocity has been, been amazing. We've been tremendously pleased. And you know, I think that when we began, something like 60 65% of our buyers were from Brooklyn. And they were generally people who had either been renting in some of these prime Brooklyn neighborhoods or had been previously first time homeowners and were maybe trading from a two to a three. They had an extra kid, et cetera. Um, as it stands now, we probably have been 50 50, 50% 50 that sort of person from Brooklyn and 50% um, Manhattanites who are moving over. I think that the majority of our Manhattan demand has been coming from downtown Manhattan. Surprisingly, a decent amount of it is the Upper West Side. But, you know, I think that when you're, you know, when you're a director at an investment bank and you know, you've got a certain pot of savings but not enough to buy a $6 million apartment in the West Village or, or NoHo, and you're living in an Avalon Bay apartment uh, on Bowery paying $6,000 a month for a one bedroom or $8,000 a month for a two bedroom, you know, affording a two to $3 million apartment in Brooklyn, given where interest rates are, is a no brainer. And if you've gotten married, if you're thinking about having a family or your family is expanding, you know, that's really, and you don't want to move to the suburbs um, or to New Jersey, then that's sort of your option. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, let's just cycle through some uh, pricing points because I think, you know, there's price per square foot that uh, basically stop being as relevant as uh, the pricing point in different neighborhoods. So what, what are people willing to pay to live in different parts um, of Brooklyn right now? David, you're in your end of the spectrum. Uh, we, we've had some sales where people paid over 2200 a foot. Um, and the significance of that is that they're very large apartments. We did a, it's a single loaded corridor building, so all the units face uh, the park, the river in Manhattan, but they're deep and um, they're, in order to get more light in them, we made them wider and then we made them taller. So they're big apartments, they're, they're average 2,500 square feet. And um, I'd say what we have on the market right now is probably you know, mostly around 2,000 a foot. So we're, basically we have about $45 million apartments left. 
Um, we've done a number of sales above 10 million. Um, and and the, uh, the average pricing point of an apartment? The average right now is about 5 million, uh, um, you know, after the price increases. So how deep is that? How deep is that market? Well, I, sales have definitely slowed down uh, considerably. We opened pretty early in this cycle. We opened with about two years to go before closings because we, we knew we had a lot of big um, expensive apartments with full taxes and, a land, and the land lease. And initially we sold very, very rapidly. Uh, we had a lot of, um, uh, this is when there was a lot of pent up demand. There was very little on the market and there were people in Brooklyn Heights who've been waiting for this building to come online and we sold to them early. Now we're selling more to people from Manhattan, actually Upper West Side, we see a lot of people from there. Um, people who are not sensitive to the pricing and, and the taxes. Um, but uh, definitely, we've been around 60% sold for a number of months now, and um, it's, uh, it's slowed down. But we're about to, we're just recently opened the on-site model, and we had a broker event the other night and anticipate um, sales to pick up as we uh, are able to bring people into the building and we get closer to uh, announcing immediate occupancy and people should be moving in in um, early next year. So what's what's a no-brainer pricing point in the sort of primary neighborhoods of Brooklyn right now? Like a million and a half, a two, two and a half? Like what what can you sell all day long? Well, David just said that you know when he went out of the gate at fourteen hundred dollars a foot, he couldn't keep them. So I think thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a foot, you can sell but all day long. You but start what to kind, what size of part? So what's the pricing point on a, on a on a unit basis? I would say two to three million dollars. Yeah, for three I, bedrooms, I, two bedrooms. I, I agree. I think the, the question also is which specific sub-market within Brooklyn we're really talking about, because clearly Dumbo's a little bit more wealth and a little bit more people coming that have more money. I think when you start looking at downtown Brooklyn, you start looking at sort of the Fourth Avenue corridor, we're doing a fair amount of business in terms of, of, of you know, it's a very different type of ultimate buyer who may not be um, as wealthy and is very aware of sort of price, you know, chunk pricing and total dollar amount that they can afford to spend on a specific unit. Um, so for, you know, our project in Dumbo, the units are very large and spacious and big two bedrooms, big three bedrooms, whereas our product that we're designing in downtown Brooklyn and the Fourth Avenue corridor in, in Park Slope is definitely more efficient. You know, there are efficient two and three bedroom apartments where price point, you know, chunk pricing is much more on our radar than- What would be that pricing point per unit? You know, I, I would say $2 million as opposed to three you know, where we're a lot more sensitive to how much someone can afford to spend versus, you know, the bulk of our buyers also in, in Dumbo have come from Tribeca, which is super interesting because it's a similar type of neighborhood. Um, and similar to Canada, I think we had a huge pent up demand when we initially opened and, you know, rent, you know, lease sold out 30% of our building in 30 days, literally. And then over the last four months, we've sold out another 30%. Um, in a more normal, you know, um, fashion, which makes a lot more sense. Um, but I do think there's still a tremendous amount of demand available. And talking about rents, we were talking about rents in Manhattan, but I also think you need to incorporate rents in Brooklyn. Rents in Brooklyn have gotten to $65, $70 a foot, depending on what neighborhood you're in. When you start to look at the math and sort of your monthly carry on a rental apartment, on a two, three bedroom apartment, and you're talking about six, $7,000 in Brooklyn to live in a nice building, it starts to make a lot of sense to look at potentially buying with interest rates where they are. I think you need to think about the townhouse market too in Brooklyn, um, which is how we originally actually thought about our project. And if you think about David's project um, or Dumbo projects, you know, those, those three and four bedroom units are sort of trading um, where townhouses were trading maybe 18 to 24 months ago. And I think you know, one of the Beastie Boys just listed his Cobble Hill house for six over, million dollars. A little overpriced. Yeah, maybe. There's, but, a, you know, there's a branding effect there. There was a fifteen million dollar trade on a townhouse in Cobble Hill just the other day. Um, you know, you start to think about the massive, massive numbers um, that townhouses in these prime neighborhoods are going for, and you know, a three or four bedroom flat that's priced from three to four million dollars, whether it's in the top of our building or in you know, Dumbo or, or Brooklyn Heights, that starts to look like a deal to certain people. Right, so I think there's, I just wanna add one more thing. All of our buildings, we do FHA programs, and the fascinating thing for us is that no one is using it. So um, we see a lot of cash buyers. Uh, we see people who come with 
30, 40, 50 percent uh, down payment. And I, I don't think it has to do with Brooklyn or with real estate. I think there's, um, we, we're looking at the kind of, we analyze all the time what kind of buyers come to us. And one of the things we see is because we deal with people who are young, uh, there's a lot of money from parents. I think one of the impacts of a uh, long uh, period of low interest rates is that the parents who used to retire, put money aside, live off on pension, um, cannot do the traditional path of putting money in CDs and they don't know what to do with the money. So there's a transition from saving and then I'll leave something for my, my kids and I'm no longer here to let me help my kids now because I, my money doesn't work. I can't make money anywhere else. So you see a lot of people coming with 40, 50% down and there's no way that they can afford it. You see it's help from the parents. I think it's because the parents don't have uh, where to put the money and that impacts also the amount of cash buyers. But give us a sense, Boaz, because your pricing points are now two or three million in the in the neighborhoods you're operating in. So give us a sense of the typical apartment or give us some sh sort of shock. Sure, sure. Points. Bushwick, we have 11 projects in Bushwick, so we're uh, looking at as cheap. I mean, Dave will know better. Uh, but uh, I think $400,000 for a beginning price, all the way to five fifty, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. And again, what everybody spoke about is the carrying cost. So they'll rent in the neighborhood for $2,600 a month. They can own something for twenty nine hundred dollars a month with the taxes, with everything. Low, we don't do large maintenance. I mean, we do a gym in the building, but that's pretty much it. Very low maintenance. Um, so Bushwick will show seven to eight hundred dollars square foot. Um, South Williamsburg, we just hit I think twelve fifty a square foot. Um, our Clinton Hill, that area, about nine to eleven hundred dollars square foot. So it's as low as seven fifty to eight, as high as twelve hundred is the. Do you feel in the secondary uh, neighborhoods like Bedstein, Bushwick, that similar effect from the brownstone or the Absolutely. townhouse market? Absolutely. Brown. I mean, our office is in in uh, Bedstein. A brownstone Bedstein will cost about one and a half to two million dollars, depends on the condition. And uh, just a, I, I like the stories behind me because real estate is not about numbers; it's about people. And you know, uh, my kids, as you know, go to private school in, in Brooklyn. Our kids are the same uh, school. Um, so I used to drop my kids off and. I never were asked about bed in my office is in bed -Stuy. Okay, now every parent go like, do you know any brownstone in bed -Stuy? you know? Um, because the kind of Too people- Too late. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I tell them, call offer. Um, um, <laughs> but um, I, I really, um, I think that people wanna live in brownstone. I don't know why. I sold my brownstone, I'm delighted to move into my, my apartment, but people still have this dream of you know Brooklyn brownstone experience. Uh, and because it's so expensive, they will go to a two, three, four bedroom apartments. So we want to talk about a lot of things, but we kind of took it slow. So we want to talk a little bit about equity sources and um, in specifically institutional equity. Um, and uh, if we have some time, uh, maybe a couple other things. So um, the real question that I have is, do you see institutional equity coming back uh, to chasing condo deals in the same appetite and hunger that they used to have about a year ago? or two years ago for rental deals, so, to, so like for the same scale, or what, what would institutional equity want to see? I mean, obviously, we all know the returns that they would like to hit, but what kind of condo project do you need to have in order to get institutional equity for, from a condo perspective? I'll give you two answers. I think on the, on the rental side, I see an increasing uh, amount of institutional equity that previously would not have looked at uh, Brooklyn looking at Brooklyn, whether it's somebody like Mitsui Fudasan or one of you know, Vanke or, um, or you know, the, some of the pension funds. So I think, I think that's interesting. Um, and then on the condo side, I think that there is absolutely no shortage of institutional equity, particularly private equity, um, that sees everything that everyone here sees in terms of the demand in Brooklyn for condos that are priced right. But there's definitely, when I talk to institutional equity sources, there's definitely uh, they're very selective, right? So how do you, Martin, do you want to talk a little bit about how selective they are in terms of what project they would go into and what project they want? The reason that institutional investors are looking for condos specifically in Brooklyn is because I don't think they're looking as aggressively in Manhattan anymore. Because, I mean, I think there's a, everyone's sort of very much on hold right now in Manhattan, sort of seeing how this high end, sort of every single apartment has to trade for over $3,000 a foot market lands up sort of processing through and flushing through. Whereas in Brooklyn, you can still underwrite deals and be at a $800 to $900 net sellable foot 
And luckily we have Ken who's comped out the market for us at 13, 14 dollars a foot and all of a sudden you're looking at a 2X and everyone's happy, right? So. But we didn't pay three right. or $400 a foot. Um, so I think, um, you know, the institutional market is very data driven. And I think fortunately for all of us up here, the data is starting to really come through where you can actually comp out very clearly by sub-market, by product type, different price points. And at the end of the day, um, it's everyone's job at all these institutional firms to try and get money out in the right types of deals with the right type of sponsorship. And if they can get to somewhere between a one eight to two times their money on a three to four year hold, I generally think that that's something that you'll get some serious attention to. Yeah, but I guess my, my sense is that, you know, there's a huge difference from corridor to corridor, even within a corridor. There's a huge difference if it's a mid block or a corner, if it's a hundred a hundred unit site or a hundred and eighty unit site, uh, and I think that I've been seeing sort of yes, there's money and there's liquidity and people want deals, but the very selective if they see a certain site as a condo, or they would like to see it as a rental and it just doesn't work anymore. Well, I think generally speaking, you can't buy land today at three hundred plus a foot with no with no tax abatements to make any rental work in Brooklyn. So. Hence the reason I think everyone's looking at a little bit more condo today, and hopefully we'll find out what happens with the, you know, the tax abatement programs over the course of the next couple of weeks. But for today, I think it's very hard to underwrite any rental. Um, I think on the condo side, it's a little bit, there's a lot of more transparency in the market. And I think in the right markets, you have certain type of investors who want to go into those markets. And then you have other types of investors who are a little bit more forward thinking right or wrong will to be determined that we'll go into secondary markets and, and start making some bets there based off of the trends they're seeing in the primary markets. Right. Buzz, you want to talk a little bit about your equity sources? I mean, you recently raised, uh, we, touched, we touched on it a little bit earlier with uh, Elliot and Jeff, but you, want, you raised some money through the, on the uh, yeah, Israeli bond, bond yeah, market. market. Uh, yeah, bond market. Yeah, I don't deal with institutional money. So uh, we have private equity, very strong arm of private equity and very short, because I know you're running out of time. Um, one of the sources of money for us is uh, a bond in Israel, and that gives us a lot of flexibility because they don't care about um, what's the product. They care about your ability to return the money. And uh, condos gives us a great flexibility because we'll finish a project within two and a half years, let's say. And from a cash flow perspective, the bondholders, if you do interest only for three years and then the rest is, uh, is uh, principal and, and interest, then that's actually very attractive to them. So uh, it's a great source. There are currently uh, 10 or 11 companies that have done that. We're by far the smallest one. We're very proud of it. I think also the window of opportunity is closing fast. Uh, you have to be now a huge company. Related is playing that game in Excel and very large companies. So it's a fascinating experience for us. Great. Um, just uh, before we finish, one last question. So how do you guys see the next 24 to 36 months, or when you're a condo developer, uh, you want to have a little bit of visibility, right? I mean, so obviously being sort of relatively on the early side of that si condo cycle at least gives you an edge, uh, but you're doing, you're doing really well on sales and marketing of all these units. How bullish you are on the next 24 months, or how much visibility you really have can, maybe you can start. You know, I think it's, um, I don't know, it's interesting. I, I think that there's not a huge pipeline of condos even still in Brooklyn. I think it's something like 2,000, you know, beyond the stuff that that we're involved in and the, the 1,700 that you're talking about. Um, and relative to demand, that's really not that many. So I think that it all gets absorbed. Yeah, you know, I think that there's two factors that, that I think about a lot. And one is... Um, you know, the combination of rising land prices in all the neighborhoods that we're discussing and rising construction prices, which really, uh, in many cases, is starting to make it untenable to do condo projects at prices where they will actually sell. Um, so if you think about that, um, you know, potentially there's a little bit of a slowdown in pipeline. And then the other thing that we think about is how Manhattan might affect, especially the high end in Brooklyn, because you know, not even counting uptown um, and not counting the financial district, but counting sort of, you know, the cooler neighborhoods of downtown, say, there's about 4,000 plus units in that pipeline, most of which are highly expensive um, over the next two years. And the highest ever annual absorption of that stuff has been about 1,000 a year. So 
it's not going to get absorbed. Um, maybe it won't get financed, but seemingly there's going to be some backup and distress in Manhattan. And I wonder sometimes how that will affect you know, some of the higher end stuff like David's project if there was an equivalent to Pure House coming down the pike. How do you guys look at it at Toll Brothers in terms of the next 24, 36 months? Um, we've seen pricing be very flat uh, across the board in the last, I'd say, nine months. So um, I think a lot of the, the pent-up demand, the, you know, the, the imbalance between supply and demand is no longer exists. And we, um, we uh, only very rarely do we have people coming into our sales offices now and saying, you know, I will pay full price. People are coming in saying, what is the concession? What are you going to do for me? And I think you make a good point about, you know, all the supply coming into Manhattan. We've got some buildings in, in really quite good neighborhoods where we're selling on a price per square foot not much different than we are at Pier House when, uh, when we're getting our top pricing at Pier House, which is close to 2000 a foot. So, yeah, I, th I see things being pretty flat. And Jeff, you mentioned you, you're not rushing to do another condo project anytime soon. Um, we, we have several condo projects in Manhattan. Um, that are boutique in nature in some of the neighborhoods that we talked about, uh, West Village, Tribeca. Um, we've been very selective with condos um, ever since the last downturn. Um, you know, we have a number of projects in Brooklyn. Uh, of those projects, we decided our, our Dumbo property would be a condo, but originally conceived as rental. And um, you know, just many discussions, market changes um, over the last you know year and a half convinced us to to go to condo. Um, I am concerned about supply over the next 24 to 36 months. There's a lot of properties that people plan to do rental. They can't make it work as a 421A. They missed the deadline. The last resort is, okay, condo. And I think we're going to see a lot of condos at the market that um, the developers are forced to push the prices up. Construction costs are high. There's a lot of demand for construction right now. Um, the land basis was not exactly where it should have been for a rental. And in the next 12 months or you know 18 months, we may see a lot of projects uh, you know come out as condos in markets that can't really absorb. I mean, if you look at you know, certain neighborhoods like Clinton Hill, for example, where we're doing rentals, all the properties surrounding us were condos. In the last downturn, they couldn't make it as condos and became rentals. And arguably, in the first place, they should have been rentals. And, and I feel like that's going to be happening in in certain neighborhoods where. The, the, con the condo developers but that's still a drop in the bucket. I mean, if you have a little project in Clinton Hill, 30, 40, 50 units, it's not going to change the whole market. No, but I'm, I'm just suggesting that I think there's a lot of those kinds of projects that at least we've seen them. They, they cross our desk where people ask us to either co-invest with them or purchase their property at a basis that we can't justify. Um, and I'm sure over the people are coming to you and saying, please sell for me. I'm stuck here. I didn't get 421A. If I look at my basis, it no longer works as a rental. And I, I think people are, are going to get on the train if they already haven't started. And we're going to see a lot of condos uh, hit the market. I mean, certainly Manhattan, they're already there. And in Brooklyn, the numbers that we're hearing, uh, I'm sure they're true. They sound very low. I would imagine that if you think about everything that's in planning and everything that's being discussed over the next couple of years, it's probably thousands of units. Um, with that said, we'll still do another condo project in Brooklyn if it's the right fit and it, and it, and it makes logical sense. Um, you know, today, tomorrow, next month, two months from now. We still are, are believers in Brooklyn condo projects. Just the numbers have to make sense. Great. I think we're going to open it. One question? Two questions? Two questions from the audience. Anyone? They're buying one bedrooms. And they're buying two as a pied de terre, as an investment, as a... My impression is that uh, they're buying one bedrooms to rent. You know, I mean, these sixty to seventy dollar rental numbers, sort of, and you know, you heard what we just said about mortgages. It starts yeah, to make like sense. Like three and a half, four percent yield at best, yeah. And generally in cash. Right. Right. Any other questions? Well, Ken, I think you. Uh... <laughs> well, Ken actually took. I a guess I brought up that Ken, trade. Ken took a portion of downtown Brooklyn and renamed it Borum Hill just to make it more historic, and that's how he. No, saw no, the <laughs> border is Skimmerhorn Street. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> You know, I, I guess with regard to our project specifically, um, you know, we bought um, from Abby Hamlin and Francis Greenberger um, what had been effectively scar tissue between Borum Hill and downtown Brooklyn. Um, 
Abby had purchased from the state of New York, effectively that entire block with the exception of two townhouses on State Street. And the reason she was able to do that was that back in the 1960s, and there's actually a book called Brownstone, The History of Brownstone, Brooklyn, where it opens with this particular block. Um, back in the 1960s, the entire block was condemned um, for not paying their state taxes or various taxes, and the state, because the city was in such disrepair, actually ended up with the property. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of our project, what we've tried to do is design a large scale project that speaks to the surrounding uh, brownstone neighborhood, aesthetically anyway, um, on State Street. And any commercial elements we've located, for example, our hotel entrances over on Skimmerhorn Street, where we felt it was more appropriate to have um, that sort of use. So we've tried to be very respectful of the neighborhood in terms of our design. Um, you know, in terms of how the people who are moving in and paying these prices are changing the neighborhoods, yeah, look, I think that there's there are positive and negative things about it. Um, you probably do see less diversity, um, but that's yet another reason why uh, restoring 421A is very important because that's going to be one of the main drivers to maintaining diversity in these neighborhoods as they become wealthier. Um, but you know, there are also positive things. I mean, these people pay taxes and they get involved in the schools and, um, you know, all the things that sort of the upper middle class brings to a neighborhood. So, um, again, you know, positives and negatives, but that's the path of growth and we should all do our best, I suppose, to make the best of it. Anyone else wants to chime in on this? <laughs> I just want to say from my perspective, just to, um, to close it, just to address this question, I think the, there is a misconception that the majority of the development is maybe destroying an historic neighborhood, which is really not true because you cannot do massive, large-scale developments in historic uh, neighborhoods because the zoning would not allow it. And so most of the neighborhoods where you're seeing the large-scale developments that these guys are working on are in neighborhoods and in streets and avenues that were not nice at all, right? They were really, really crappy. And I think it's really nice to see, you know, a store and a high rise made of glass and steel uh, in place of a bodega and a really sort of rinky dink, another second story that maybe someone lives there and maybe not. I think it makes the streets safer and I think it makes retail better and I think it's economic growth. And I don't think that development uh, is really, um, Ruined Brooklyn. I think we're just at the beginning of a of a, of a renaissance. I just want to kind of uh, close with that. Thank you so much, everybody.